Mechanica by Aristotle. Translated by Edward Forster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Preface Whilst the scientific standpoint of the Mechanica is certainly peripatetic, the writer's interest in the practical application of the problems involved is quite unaristotelian. The text used for this translation is that of O. Appelt, Teubner, 1888. The edition of J. P. van Capelle, Amsterdam, 1812, has been invaluable both for its apparatus criticus and for its commentary. My warmest thanks are due to Mr. W. D. Ross, Fellow of Oriel College, for many valuable suggestions, and to my father, Mr. M. S. Forster, Magister Artium, Baccalaureus Civilis Legis, Baccalaureus Scientiae, whose constant advice, particularly on scientific points, has assisted me on every page of this treatise. E. S. F. Contents Chapter 1 Introduction The Problems of Mechanics The Marvelous Properties of the Circle Why Are Large Balances More Accurate Than Small? Chapter 2 Why In a Balance if the cord is attached to the upper surface of the beam, does the beam rise again when the weight is taken away, whereas if the cord is attached to the lower surface it does not rise? Chapter 3. Why does a lever raise a great weight with the exercise of little force, whereas the lighter a weight is, the easier it is to move? and the weight is less without the lever. Chapter 4. Why do the rowers who are amidships contribute most to the movement of the ship? Chapter 5. Why does a small rudder move a large ship with the exercise of little force? Chapter 6. Why does a ship travel quicker the higher the yardarm is raised? Chapter 7. Why do sailors draw in the nearer part of the sail, and let out the part nearer to the bow when they wish to keep their course in an unfavorable breeze? Chapter 8. Why are spherical and circular bodies easy to move? Chapter 9. Why are bodies moved more easily and quickly when they are lifted or drawn along by circles of large circumference. Chapter 10. Why does a balance move more easily without a weight upon it? Chapter 11. Why are heavy weights more easily conveyed on rollers than on carts? Chapter 12. Why do missiles travel further from a sling than from the hand? Chapter 13. Why is a capstan easier to move when it has long than when it has short bars, and a windlass when it has long handles? Chapter 14. Why is it easier to break a piece of wood across the knee if one holds the ends at equal distances from the knee? Chapter 15. Why are pebbles round? though formed from stones and shells, which are elongated in shape. Chapter 16. Why is it that the longer the plank is, the weaker it is, and the more easily it bends? Chapter 17. Why does a wedge, which is a small thing, exert great pressure and split large masses? Chapter 18. Why is it that great weights can be moved by means of a double pulley with the exercise of little force? 
Chapter 19. Why is it that an axe does not cut wood if it be loaded with a heavy weight, and its edge placed on the wood, whereas it splits the wood if struck upon it? Chapter 20. Why does a steel yard weigh large masses with a small counterpoise? Chapter 21. Why can a dentist extract a tooth more easily with a tooth extractor, which is an additional weight, than with the hand only? Chapter 22. Why are nuts more easily cracked with nut crackers than by a blow? Chapter 23. Why is it that in a rhombus, when the points at the extremities are moved in two movements, they do not describe equal straight lines, but one of them a much longer line than the other. Chapter 24. Why do a large and a small circle trace an equal path when placed about the same center, but when they are rolled separately their paths are to one another in the proportion of their dimensions? Chapter 25. Why are beds so constructed that one dimension is double the other, and why are not bed ropes stretched diagonally? Chapter 26. Why is it more difficult to carry a long plank on the shoulder if it is held at the end than if it is held in the middle? Chapter 27. Why is a long object more difficult to carry on the shoulder than a short one? Chapter 28. Why, in the construction of a swipe for drawing water, is a weight put at the end of the bar, the bucket itself being a weight? Chapter 29. Why, when two men are carrying a weight on a piece of wood, is the pressure on them unequal unless the weight is in the middle? Chapter 30. Why is it that in rising from a sitting position it is necessary to make an acute angle between the thigh and the lower leg? Chapter 31. Why is a body which is already in motion easier to move than one which is at rest? Chapter 32. Why does an object which is thrown eventually come to a standstill? Chapter 33. Why is it that a body is carried on by a motion not its own, though that which impelled it does not keep following it and pushing it along? Chapter 34. Why is it that neither small nor large objects necessarily travel far when thrown, but their movement has due relation to the person who throws them? Chapter 35. Why is it that an object which is carried along in whirling water is always eventually carried into the middle? Mechanica Our wonder is excited, firstly, by phenomena which occur in accordance with nature, but of which we do not know the cause, and secondly, by those which are produced by art, despite nature, for the benefit of mankind. Nature often operates contrary to human expediency, for she always follows the same course without deviation, whereas human expediency is always changing. When, therefore, we have to do something contrary to nature, the difficulty of it causes us perplexity, and art has to be called to our aid. The kind of art which helps us in such perplexities we call mechanical skill. The words of the poet Antiphon are quite true. Mastered by nature, we o'ercome by art. Instances of this are those cases in which the less prevails over the greater, and where forces of small motive power move great weights. In fact, practically all those problems which we call mechanical problems. 
they are not quite identical, nor yet entirely unconnected with natural problems. They have something in common both with mathematical and with natural speculations. For while mathematics demonstrates how phenomena come to pass, natural science demonstrates in what medium they occur. Among questions of a mechanical kind are included those which are connected with the lever. It seems strange that a great weight can be moved with but little force, and that when the addition of more weight is involved. For the very same weight which one cannot move at all without a lever, one can move quite easily with it, in spite of the additional weight of the lever. The original cause of all such phenomena is the circle. It is quite natural that this should be so, for there is nothing strange in a lesser marvel being caused by a greater marvel, and it is a very great marvel that contraries should be present together, and the circle is made up of contraries. For, to begin with, it is formed by motion and rest, things which are by nature opposed to one another. Hence, in examining the circle, we need not be much astonished at the contradictions which occur in connection with it. Firstly, in the line which encloses the circle, being without breadth, two contraries somehow appear, namely the concave and the convex. These are as much opposed to one another as the great is to the small, the mean being in the latter case the equal, in the former the straight. Therefore, just as, if they are to change into one another, the greater and smaller must become equal before they can pass into the other extreme, so a line must become straight in passing from convex into concave, or, on the other hand, from concave into convex and curved. This, then, is one peculiarity of the circle. Another peculiarity of the circle is that it moves in two contrary directions at the same time, for it moves simultaneously to a forward and a backward position. Such, too, is the nature of the radius which describes a circle, for its extremity comes back again to the same position from which it starts. For, when it moves continuously, its last position is a return to its original position, in such a way that it has clearly undergone a change from that position. Therefore, as has already been remarked, there is nothing strange in the circle being the origin of any and every marvel. The phenomena observed in the balance can be referred to the circle, and to those observed in the lever to the balance, while practically all the other phenomena of mechanical motion are connected with the lever. Furthermore, since no two points on one and the same radius travel with the same rapidity, but of two points that which is further from the fixed center travels more quickly, many marvelous phenomena occur in the motion of circles, which will be demonstrated in the following problems. Because a circle moves in two contrary forms of motion at the same time, and because one extremity of the diameter, alpha, moves forwards, and the other, beta, moves backwards. Some people contrive, so that, as the result of a single movement, a number of circles move simultaneously in contrary directions, like the wheels of brass and iron which they make and dedicate in the temples. Let alpha beta be a circle, and gamma delta another circle in contact with it. 
then if the diameter of the circle alpha beta moves forward the diameter gamma delta will move in a backward direction as compared with the circle alpha beta as long as the diameter moves round the same point the circle gamma delta therefore will move in the opposite direction to the circle alpha beta again the circle gamma delta will itself make the adjoining circle epsilon zeta move in an opposite direction to itself for the same reason the same thing will happen in the case of a larger number of circles only one of them being set in motion mechanicians seizing on this inherent peculiarity of the circle and hiding the principle construct an instrument so as to exhibit the marvellous character of the device while they obscure the cause of it chapter one first then a question arises as to what takes place in the case of the balance why are larger balances more accurate than smaller and the fundamental principle of this is why is it that the radius which extends further from the centre is displaced quicker than the smaller radius when the near radius is moved by the same force now we use the word quicker in two senses if an object traverses an equal distance in less time we call it quicker and also if it traverses a greater distance in equal time now the greater radius describes a greater circle in equal time for the outer circumference is greater than the inner the reason of this is that the radius undergoes two displacements now if the two displacements of a body are in any fixed proportion the resulting displacement must necessarily be a straight line and this line is the diagonal of the figure made by the lines drawn in this proportion let the proportion of the two displacements be as alpha beta to alpha gamma and let alpha be brought to beta and the line alpha beta brought down to eta gamma again let alpha be brought to delta and the line alpha beta to epsilon then if the proportion of the two displacements be maintained alpha delta must necessarily have the same proportion to alpha epsilon as alpha beta to alpha gamma therefore the small parallelogram is similar to the greater and their diagonal is the same so that alpha will be at zeta in the same way it can be shown at whatever points the displacement be arrested that the point alpha will in all cases be on the diagonal and the converse is also true it is plain that if a point be moved along the diagonal by two displacements it is necessarily moved according to the proportion of the sides of the parallelogram for otherwise it will not be moved along the diagonal if it be moved in two displacements in no fixed ratio for any time its displacement cannot be in a straight line for let it be a straight line this then being drawn as a diagonal and the sides of the parallelogram filled in the point must necessarily be moved according to the proportion of the sides for this has already been proved therefore if the same proportion be not maintained during any interval of time 
the point will not describe a straight line. For if the proportion were maintained during any interval, the point must necessarily describe a straight line by the reasoning above. So that if the two displacements do not maintain any proportion during any interval, a curve is produced. Now, that the radius of a circle has two simultaneous displacements is plain from these considerations, and because the point, from being vertically above the center, comes back to the perpendicular, so as to be again perpendicularly above the center. Let alpha, beta, gamma be a circle, and let the point beta at the summit be displaced to delta by one force, and come eventually to gamma by the other force. If, then, it were moved in the proportion of beta delta to delta gamma, it would move along the diagonal beta gamma. But, in the present case, as it is moved in no such proportion, it moves along the curve beta epsilon gamma. And, if one of two displacements caused by the same forces is more interfered with and the other less, it is reasonable to suppose that the motion more interfered with will be slower than the motion less interfered with, which seems to happen in the case of the greater and less of the radii of circles. For, on account of the extremity of the lesser radius being nearer the stationary center than that of the greater, being, as it were, pulled in a contrary direction towards the middle, the extremity of the lesser moves more slowly. This is the case with every radius, and it moves in a curve, naturally along the tangent, and unnaturally towards the center. And the lesser radius is always moved more in respect of its unnatural motion, for, being nearer to the retarding center, it is more constrained. And that the less of two radii having the same center is moved more than the greater in respect of the unnatural motion is plain from what follows. Let beta, gamma, epsilon, delta be a circle. And chi, nu, mu, xi, another smaller circle within it, both having the same center alpha. And let the diameters be drawn, gamma delta and beta epsilon in the large circle, and mu chi and nu xi in the small. And let the rectangle delta psi rho gamma be completed. If the radius alpha beta comes back to the same position from which it started, id est, to alpha beta, it is plain that it moved towards itself, and likewise alpha chi will come to alpha chi. But alpha chi moves more slowly than alpha beta, as has been stated, because the interference is greater, and alpha chi is more retarded. Now, let alpha, theta, eta be drawn, and from theta a perpendicular upon alpha, beta, within the circle theta, zeta, and further from theta let theta, omega be drawn parallel to alpha, beta, and omega, upsilon, and eta, 
kappa, perpendiculars, on, alpha, beta, then omega, upsilon, and theta, zeta, are equal. Therefore, beta, upsilon, is less than chi, zeta, for in unequal circles, equal straight lines drawn perpendicular to the diameter cut off smaller portions of the diameter in the greater circles. Omega, upsilon, and theta, zeta being equal. Footnote. According to the parallelogram of distances, the result ought to be beta, upsilon, must have the same proportion to upsilon omega as chi zeta has to theta zeta. But it is proved that upsilon omega and theta zeta are equal. But beta upsilon and chi zeta unequal. So that the theory of the parallelogram fails. Why is this? The answer is that the same force moves longer radii quicker than shorter. End footnote. Now the radius alpha theta describes the arc chi theta in the same time as the extremity of the radius beta alpha has described an arc greater than beta omega in the greater circle. For the natural displacement is equal and the unnatural less. Beta upsilon being less than chi zeta. Whereas they ought to be in proportion, the two natural motions in the same ratio to each other as the two unnatural motions. Now the radius alpha beta has described an arc, beta eta, greater than beta omega. It must necessarily have described beta eta in the time in which chi describes chi theta. For that will be its position when in the two circles the proportion between the unnatural and natural movements holds good. If then the natural movement is greater in the greater circle, the unnatural movement too would agree in being proportionally greater, in that case only, where beta is moved along beta eta, while chi is moved along chi theta. For in that case the point beta comes by its natural movement to eta, and by its unnatural movement to kappa, eta kappa being perpendicular from eta. And as eta kappa to beta kappa, so is theta zeta to chi zeta, which will be plain if beta and chi be joined to eta and theta. Footnote. For the triangles beta, kappa, eta, and chi, zeta, theta, are similar, having all their sides parallel, each to each. End footnote. But if the arc described by beta be less or greater than eta, beta, the result will not be the same, nor will the natural movement be proportional to the unnatural in the two circles. So that the reason why the point further from the center is moved quicker by the same force, and the greater radius describes the greater circle, is plain from what has been said, and hence the reason is also clear why larger balances are more accurate than smaller. For the cord by which a balance is suspended acts as the center, for it is at rest, and the parts of the balance on either side form the radii. 
Therefore, by the same weight, the end of the balance must necessarily be moved quicker in proportion as it is more distant from the cord, and some weight must be imperceptible to the senses in small balances, but perceptible in large balances. For there is nothing to prevent the movement being so small as to be invisible to the eye. Whereas in the large balance the same load makes the movement visible. In some cases the effect is clearly seen in both balances, but much more in the larger on account of the amplitude of the displacement caused by the same load being much greater in the larger balance. And thus dealers in purple, in weighing it, use contrivances with intent to deceive putting the cord out of centre and pouring lead into one arm of the balance, or using the wood towards the root of a tree for the end towards which they want it to incline, or a knot, if there be one in the wood, for the part of the wood where the root is, is heavier, and a knot is a kind of root. CHAPTER Two how is it that if the cord is attached to the upper surface of the beam of a balance if one takes away the weight when the balance is depressed on one side the beam rises again whereas if the cord is attached to the lower surface of the beam it does not rise but remains in the same position is it because when the cord is attached above there is more of the beam on one side of the perpendicular than on the other the cord being the perpendicular in that case the side on which the greater part of the beam is must necessarily sink until the line which divides the beam into two equal parts reaches the actual perpendicular since the weight now presses on the side of the beam which is elevated. Let beta gamma be a straight beam, and alpha delta a cord. If alpha delta be produced, it will form the perpendicular alpha delta mu. If the portion of the beam towards beta be depressed, beta will be displaced to epsilon, and gamma to zeta, and so the line dividing the beam into two halves, which was originally delta mu, part of the perpendicular, will become delta theta, when the beam is depressed, so that the part of the beam, epsilon zeta, which is outside the perpendicular alpha mu will be greater by theta pi than half the beam if therefore the weight at epsilon be taken away zeta must sink because the side towards epsilon is shorter it has been proved then that when the cord is attached above if the weight be removed the beam rises again. But if the support be from below, the contrary takes place, for then the part which is depressed is more than half of the beam, or in other words, more than the part marked off by the original perpendicular. It does not therefore rise when the weight is removed, for the part that is elevated is lighter. Let nu xi be the beam when horizontal, and kappa lambda mu the perpendicular dividing nu xi into two halves. When the weight is placed at nu, nu will be displaced to omicron, and xi to rho and kappa lambda to lambda theta, 
so that kappa omicron is greater than lambda rho by theta lambda kappa footnote id est the figure kappa lambda omicron theta is greater than the figure kappa rho lambda by twice the triangle kappa lambda theta End footnote. if the weight therefore is removed the beam must necessarily remain in the same position for the excess of the part in which omicron kappa is over half the beam acts as a weight and remains depressed chapter three why is it that as has been remarked at the beginning of this treatise the exercise of little force raises great weights with the help of a lever in spite of the added weight of the lever whereas the less heavy a weight is the easier it is to move and the weight is less without the lever does the reason lie in the fact that the lever acts like the beam of a balance with the cord attached below and divided into two unequal parts the fulcrum then takes the place of the cord for both remain at rest and act as the centre now since a longer radius moves more quickly than a shorter one under pressure of an equal weight and since the lever requires three elements videlicet the fulcrum corresponding to the cord of a balance and forming the centre and two weights that exerted by the person using the lever and the weight which is to be moved this being so as the weight moved is to the weight moving it so inversely is the length of the arm bearing the weight to the length of the arm nearer to the power the further one is from the fulcrum the more easily may one raise the weight the reason being that which has already been stated namely that a longer radius describes a larger circle so with the exertion of the same force the motive weight will change its position more than the weight which it moves because it is further from the fulcrum let alpha beta be a lever gamma the weight to be lifted delta the motive weight and epsilon the fulcrum the position of delta after it has raised the weight will be eta and that of gamma the weight raised will be kappa chapter four why is it that those rowers who are amid ships move the ship most is it because the oar acts as a lever the fulcrum then is the thole pin for it remains in the same place and the weight is the sea which the oar displaces and the power that moves the lever is the rower the further he who moves a weight is from the fulcrum the greater is the weight which he moves for then the radius becomes greater and the thole pin acting as the fulcrum is the centre now amid ships there is more of the oar inside the ship than elsewhere for there the ship is widest so that on both sides a longer portion of the oar can be inside the two walls of the vessel the ship then moves because as the blade presses against the sea the handle of the oar which is inside the ship advances forward and the ship being firmly attached to the thole pin advances with it in the same direction as the handle of the oar for where the blade displaces most water there necessarily must the ship be propelled most and it displaces most water where the handle is furthest from the thole pin this is why the rowers who are amid ships move the ship most for it is in the middle of the ship that the length of the oar 
from the thole-pin inside the ship is greatest. Chapter 5 Why is it that the rudder, being small, and at the extreme end of the ship, has such power that vessels of great burden can be moved by a small tiller, and the strength of one man only gently exerted? Is it because the rudder, too, is a lever, and the steersman works it? The fulcrum, then, is the point at which the rudder is attached to the ship, and the whole rudder is the lever, and the sea is the weight, and the steersman the moving force. The rudder does not take the sea squarely, as the oar does, for it does not move the ship forward but diverts it as it moves, taking the sea obliquely. For since, as we saw, the sea is the weight, the rudder, pressing in a contrary direction, diverts the ship. For the fulcrum turns in a contrary direction to the sea. When the sea turns inwards, the fulcrum turns outwards, and the ship follows it, because it is attached to it. The oar, pushing the weight squarely, and being itself thrust in turn by it, impels the ship straight forward. But the rudder, as it has an oblique position, causes an oblique motion, one way or the other. It is placed at the stern and not amidships, because it is easiest to move a mass which has to be moved if it is moved from one extremity. For the fore part travels quickest, because, just as in objects that are travelling along, the movement ceases at the end. So, too, in any object which is continuous, the movement is weakest towards the end. And, if it is weakest in that part, it is easy to check it. Footnote. The author's theory seems to be that in a continuous object the fore part has more motion than the hinder part. It is perhaps due to a false generalization from the fact that in the case of a horse and cart the motive power is in front. End footnote. For this reason, then, the rudder is placed at the stern, and also because, as there is little motion there, the displacement is much greater at the extremity, since the equal angle stands on a longer base in proportion as the enclosing lines are longer. From this it is also plain why the ship advances in the opposite direction more than does the oar blade for the same bulk, moved by the same force, progresses more in air than in water. For let alpha beta be the oar, and gamma the thole-pin, and alpha the end of the oar inside the ship, and beta that in the sea. Then, if alpha be moved to delta, beta will not be at epsilon, for beta epsilon is equal to alpha delta, and so beta, if it were at epsilon, would have changed its position as much as alpha, whereas it has really, as we saw, traversed a shorter distance. Beta will therefore be at zeta. Theta then cuts alpha beta not at gamma, but below it, for Beta zeta is less than alpha delta, so that theta zeta is less than delta theta, for the triangles are similar. The center, gamma, will also have been displaced, for it moves in a contrary direction to beta, the end of the oar in the sea, and in the same direction as alpha, the end in the ship, and alpha changes its position to delta. So the ship will also change its position, and it advances in the same direction as the handle of the oar. 
the rudder also acts in the same way, except that, as we saw above, it contributes nothing to the forward motion of the ship, but merely thrusts the stern sideways, one way or the other. For then the bow inclines in the contrary direction. The point where the rudder is attached must be considered, as it were, the center of the mass which is moved, corresponding to the thole-pin in the case of the oar. But the middle of the ship moves in the direction to which the tiller is put over. If the steersman puts it inwards, the stern alters its position in that direction, but the bow inclines in the contrary direction, for while the bow remains in the same place, the position of the ship as a whole is altered. Chapter 6 Why is it that the higher the yard-arm is raised, the quicker does a vessel travel with the same sail and in the same breeze? Footnote the only effect of raising the yard-arm would be to make the vessel heel over more with a side-wind, or to depress the bows if the wind was astern, or the stern if the wind were ahead. The most probable explanation is that the Greek sailor, being essentially a coaster, preferred a high sail in order to catch the wind, which might be cut off, by hills and cliffs. End footnote. Is it because the mast is a lever, and the socket in which it is fixed the fulcrum, and the weight which it has to move is the boat, and the motive power is the wind in the sail? If the same power moves the same weight more easily and quickly, the further away the fulcrum is, then the yard-arm, being raised higher, brings the sail also further away from the mast-socket, which is the fulcrum. CHAPTER Seven. Why is it that when sailors wish to keep their course in an unfavorable wind, they draw in the part of the sail which is nearer to the steersman, and, working the sheet, let out the part towards the bows. Is it because the rudder cannot counteract the wind when it is strong, but can do so when there is only a little wind, and so they draw in sail? The wind then bears the ship along, while the rudder turns the wind into a favoring breeze, counteracting it and serving as a lever against the sea. The sailors also, at the same time, contend with the wind by leaning their weight in the opposite direction. Chapter 8 Why is it that spherical and circular forms are easier to move? A circle can revolve in three different ways, either along its circumference, the center correspondingly changing its position, as a carriage wheel revolves, or round the center only, as pulleys move, the center being at rest, or it can turn, as does the potter's wheel, parallel to the ground, the center being at rest. Do not circular forms move quickest, firstly, because they have a very slight contact with the ground, like a circle in contact at a single point, and secondly, because there is no friction, for the angle is well away from the ground. Further, if they come into collision with another body, they only are in contact with it again to a very small extent. If it were a question of a rectilinear body, owing to its sides being straight, it would have a considerable contact with the ground. Further, he who moves circular objects moves them in a direction to which they have an inclination as regards weight, for 
when the diameter of the circle is perpendicular to the ground, the circle being in contact with the ground only at one point, the diameter divides the weight equally on either side of it. But as soon as it is set in motion, there is more weight on the side to which it is moved, as though it had an inclination in that direction. Hence it is easier for one who pushes it forward to move it, for it is easier to move any body in a direction to which it inclines, just as it is difficult to move it contrary to its inclination. Some people further assert that the circumference of a circle keeps up a continual motion, just as bodies which are at rest remain so owing to their resistance. This can be illustrated by a comparison of larger with smaller circles. Larger circles can be moved more readily with an exertion of the same amount of force, and move other weights with them, because the angle of the larger circle, as compared with that of the smaller, has an inclination which is in the same proportion as the diameter of the one is to the diameter of the other. Now, if any circle be taken, there is always a lesser circle than which it is greater. For the lesser circles, which can be described, are infinite in number. Now, if it is the case that one circle has a greater inclination as compared with another circle, and is correspondingly easy to move, then it is also the case that if a circle does not touch the ground with its circumference, but moves either parallel to the ground, exempli gratia, the potter's wheel, or with the motion of a pulley, the circle and the bodies moved by the circle will have a further cause of inclination. For circular objects of this kind move most easily and move weights with them. Exempli gratia, the pot on the potter's wheel. Can it be that this is due to a reason other than that they have only a very slight contact with the ground, and consequently encounter little friction? This reason is that which we have already mentioned, namely, that the circle is made up of two forms of motion, and so one of them always has an inclination. And those who move a circle move it when it has, as it were, a motion of its own, when they move it at any point on its circumference. They are moving the circumference when it is already in motion, for the motive force pushes it in a tangential direction, while the circle itself moves in the motion which takes place along the diameter. Chapter 9. How is it that we can move objects more easily and quickly when they are lifted or drawn along by circles of large circumference? Why, for example, are large pulleys more effective than small, and, similarly, large rollers? Is it because the longer the radius is, the further the object is moved in the same time, and so it will do the same also with an equal weight upon it? Just as we said that large balances are more accurate than small, for the cord is the center, and the parts of the beam on either side of the cord are the radii. Chapter 10. Why is it that a balance moves more easily without a weight upon it than with one? So too, with a wheel or anything of that nature, the smaller and lighter is easier to move than the heavier and larger. Is it because that which is heavy is difficult to move, not only vertically, but also horizontally. For one can move a weight with difficulty contrary to its inclination, but easily in the direction of its inclination, and it does not incline in a horizontal direction. 
Chapter 11. Why is it that it is easier to convey heavy weights on rollers than on carts, though the latter have large wheels and the former a small circumference? Is it because a weight placed upon rollers encounters no friction, whereas when placed upon a cart it has the axle at which it encounters friction? For it presses on the axle from above in addition to the horizontal pressure. But an object on rollers is moved at two points on them, where the ground supports them below, and where the weight is imposed above. The circle revolves at both these points, and is thrust along as it moves. Chapter 12 Why is it that a missile travels further from a sling than from the hand, although he who casts it has more control over the missile in his hand than when he holds the weight suspended? Further, in the latter case, he moves two weights, that of the sling and the missile, while in the former case he moves only the missile. Is it because he who casts the missile does so when it is already in motion in the sling? For he swings it round many times before he lets it go, whereas when cast from the hand it starts from a state of rest. Now, any object is easier to move when it is already in motion than when it is at rest. Or, while this is one reason, is there a further reason, namely, that in using a sling the hand becomes the center, and the sling the radius, and the longer the radius is, the more quickly it moves. And so a cast from the hand is short, as compared with a cast from a sling. Chapter 13. Why is it that longer bars are moved more easily than shorter ones round the same capstan, and, similarly, lighter and broader windlasses are moved more easily by the same force than stouter and narrower windlasses? Is it because the windlass and the capstan form a center, and the outer masses the radii? For the radii of greater circles are moved more readily and further by the same force than those of lesser circles. For the extremity further from the center is moved more readily by the same force. Therefore, in the case of the capstan, they use the bars as a means whereby they turn it more easily, and in the case of the lighter and broader windlasses, the part outside the central cylinder is more extended, and this portion forms the radius of the circle. Chapter 14. Why is it that a piece of wood of the same size is more easily broken against the knee if one breaks it holding the ends at equal distance from the knee than if it is held close to the knee. And if one leans a piece of wood upon the ground and places one's foot on it, why does one break it more easily if one grasps it at a distance from the foot rather than near it? Is it because in the former case the knee and in the latter the foot is the center, and the further an object is from the center, the more easily is it always moved, and that which is to be broken must be moved. Chapter 15 Why is it that the so-called pebbles found on beaches are round, though they are originally formed from stones and shells, which are elongated in shape. Is it because objects whose outer surfaces are far removed from their middle point are borne along more quickly by the movements to which they are subjected? The middle of such objects acts as the center, and the distance thence to the exterior 
becomes the radius, and a longer radius always describes a greater circle than a shorter radius, when the force which moves them is equal. An object which traverses a greater space in the same time travels more quickly, and objects which travel more quickly from an equal distance strike harder against other objects, and the more they strike, the more they are themselves struck. It follows, therefore, that objects in which the distance from the middle to the exterior is greater always become broken, and in this process they must necessarily become round. So, in the case of pebbles, because the sea moves, and they move with it, the result is that they are always in motion, and as they roll about they come into collision with other objects, and it is their extremities which are necessarily most affected. Chapter 16 Why is it that the longer a plank of wood is, the weaker it is, and the more it bends when lifted up? Why, for example, does a short, thin plank about two cubits long bend less than a thick plank a hundred cubits long. Is it because the length of the plank, when it is lifted, forms a lever, a weight, and a fulcrum? The first part of it, then, which the hand raises becomes, as it were, a fulcrum, and the part towards the end becomes the weight. And so, the longer the space is from the fulcrum to the end, the more the plank must bend for it must necessarily bend more the further away it is from the fulcrum. Therefore the ends of the lever must be subject to pressure. If, then, the lever is bent, it must bend more when it is lifted up. This is exactly what happens in the case of long planks of wood, whereas in the case of shorter planks the extremity is near the fulcrum, which is at rest. Chapter 17. How is it that great weights and masses can be split, and a violent pressure be exerted with a wedge, which is a small thing? Is it because the wedge forms two levers working in opposite directions, and each has a weight and fulcrum which presses upwards or downwards? Further, the impetus of the blow causes the weight which strikes the wedge and moves it to be very considerable, and it has all the more force because by reason of its speed it is moving what is already moving. Although the lever is short, great force accompanies it, and so it causes a much more violent movement than we should expect from an estimate of its size. Let alpha, beta, gamma be the wedge, and delta, epsilon, eta, zeta, the object which is acted upon by it. Then alpha, beta is a lever, and the weight is below at beta, and the fulcrum is zeta, delta. On the opposite side is the lever, beta, gamma. When Alpha gamma is struck, it brings both of these into use as levers, for it presses upwards at the point beta. Chapter 18 Why is it that if one puts two pulleys on two blocks which are in opposite positions and places round them a cord with one end attached to one of the blocks, and the other supported by or passed over the pulleys. If one pulls at the end of the cord, one can move great weights, even if the force which draws them is small. Is it because the same weight is raised by less force if a lever is employed than by the hand, and the pulley acts in the same way as a lever? so that a single pulley will draw more easily 
and draw a far heavier weight with a slight pull than the hand alone can. Two pulleys raise this weight with more than double the velocity, for the second pulley draws a still less weight than if it drew alone by itself, when the rope is passed on to it from the other pulley, for the other pulley makes the weight still less. Thus, if the cord is passed through a greater number, the difference is great, even when there are only a few pulleys, so that if the load under the first weighs four minae, much less is drawn by the last. In building operations they easily move great weights, for they transfer them from one pulley to another, and thence again to windlasses and levers, and this is equivalent to constructing a number of pulleys. Chapter 19 How is it that if you place a heavy axe on a piece of wood and put a heavy weight on the top of it, it does not cleave the wood to any considerable extent, whereas if you lift the axe and strike the wood with it, it does split it, although the axe, when it strikes the blow, has much less weight upon it than when it is placed on the wood and pressing on it. Is it because the effect is produced entirely by movement, and that which is heavy gets more movement from its weight when it is in motion than when it is at rest? So, when it is merely placed on the wood, it does not move with the movement derived from its weight. But when it is put into motion, it moves with the movement derived from its weight, and also with that imparted by the striker. Furthermore, the axe works like a wedge, and a wedge, though small, can split large masses because it is made up of two levers working in opposite directions. Chapter 20. Why is it that steelyards weigh great weights of meat with a small counterpoise, the whole forming only a half balance? For a pan is fixed only at the end where the object weighed is placed, and at the other end there is nothing but the steelyard. Is it because the steelyard is at once a beam and a lever? for it is a beam inasmuch as each position of the cord becomes the center of the steelyard. Now at one end it has a pan, and at the other, instead of a pan, the counterpoise which is fixed in the beam, just as if one were to place the other pan with the counterpoise in it at the end of the steelyard. For it is clear that it draws the same weight when it lies in the second pan. But in order that the single beam may act as many beams, many such positions for the cord are situated along a beam of this kind, in each of which the part on the side of the counterpoise forms half the steelyard and acts as the weight, the positions of the cord being moved through equal intervals so that one can calculate how much weight is drawn by what lies in the pan, and thus know, when the steelyard is horizontal, how much weight the pan holds for each of the several positions of the cord, as has been explained. In short, this may be regarded as a balance, having one pan in which the object weighed is placed, and the other in which is the weight of the steelyard and so the steelyard at the other end is the counterpoise. And, since it is as described, it acts as an adjustable balance beam, with as many forms as there are positions of the cord. And, in all cases, when the cord is nearer the pan and the weight upon it, it draws a greater weight on account of the whole steelyard being an inverted lever for the cord in each position is a fulcrum, although it is above, 
and the weight is what is in the pan. And the greater the length of the lever from the fulcrum, the more easily it produces motion in the case of the lever, and in the case of the balance causes equilibrium, and counterbalances the weight of the steelyard near the counterpoise. Chapter 21 How is it that dentists extract teeth more easily by applying the additional weight of a tooth extractor than with the bare hand only? Is it because the tooth is more inclined to slip in the fingers than from the tooth extractor? Or does not the iron slip more than the hand and fail to grasp the tooth all round, since the flesh of the fingers, being soft, both adheres to and fits round the tooth better? The truth is that the tooth extractor consists of two levers opposed to one another, with the same fulcrum at the point where the pincers join. So they use the instrument to draw teeth in order to move them more easily. Let alpha be one extremity of the tooth extractor, and beta the other extremity which draws the tooth, and alpha delta zeta one lever, and beta gamma epsilon the other, and gamma theta alpha the fulcrum, and let the tooth which is the weight to be lifted be at the point iota, where the two levers meet. The dentist holds and moves the tooth at the same time with beta and zeta, and when he has moved it, he can take it out more easily with his fingers than with the instrument. Chapter 22 Why is it that men easily crack nuts without striking a blow upon them in the instruments made for this purpose? For with nutcrackers much power is lost, namely that of motion and violent impetus. Further, if one crushes them with a hard and heavy instrument, one can crack them much more quickly than with a light wooden instrument. Is it because the nut is crushed on two of its sides by two levers, and bodies can easily be rent asunder with a lever? For the nutcracker consists of two levers, with the same fulcrum, namely alpha, their point of connection. As, therefore, Epsilon and Zeta would have been easily moved by a small force if they had been pushed apart, so they are easily brought together, the levers being moved at the points Delta and Gamma. So Epsilon Gamma and Zeta Delta, being levers, exert the same or even greater force than that which the weight exerted when the nut was cracked by a blow. For when weight is put upon the levers, they move in opposite directions and compress and break the object at kappa. For this very reason, too, the nearer kappa is to alpha, the sooner it is subjected to pressure. For the further the lever extends from the fulcrum, the more easily and more powerfully does it move an object with the exercise of the same force. Alpha, then, is the fulcrum, and delta, alpha, zeta, and gamma, alpha, epsilon, are the levers. The nearer, therefore, kappa is to the angle at alpha, the nearer it is to the point where the levers are connected, and this is the fulcrum. So, with the same force bringing them together, zeta and epsilon must be subjected to more weight, and so, when weight is exerted from two contrary directions, more compression must take place, and the more an object is compressed, the sooner it breaks. 
Chapter 23 Why is it that in a rhombus, when the points at the extremities are moved in two movements, they do not describe equal straight lines, but one of them a much longer line than the other? Further, and this is the same question, why does the point alpha moving along the side alpha beta describe a resultant line alpha delta less than the side for the point describes the diagonal the shorter distance and the line alpha beta moves along the side alpha gamma the longer distance and yet the line has but one movement and the point two movements footnote this is a special case of the theorem known as the parallelogram of velocities and footnote for let alpha move along alpha beta to beta and beta to alpha with the same velocity and let the line alpha beta move along alpha gamma parallel to gamma delta with the same velocity then the point alpha must move along the diagonal alpha delta and beta along beta gamma and both must describe these diagonals simultaneously while alpha beta moves along the side alpha gamma for let alpha be moved the distance alpha epsilon and the line alpha beta the distance alpha zeta and let zeta eta be drawn parallel to alpha beta and a line drawn from epsilon to complete the parallelogram alpha zeta theta epsilon the small parallelogram then thus formed is similar to the whole parallelogram thus alpha zeta equals alpha epsilon so that alpha has been moved along the side alpha epsilon to epsilon while the line alpha beta would be moved the distance alpha zeta thus alpha will be on the diagonal at theta and so must always move along the diagonal and in the whole parallelogram the side alpha beta will describe the side alpha gamma and the point alpha the diagonal alpha delta simultaneously in the same way it may be proved that beta moves along the diagonal beta gamma beta epsilon being equal to beta eta for if the parallelogram be completed by drawing a line from eta the interior parallelogram epsilon theta eta beta will be similar to the whole parallelogram and beta will be on the diagonal at the point where the sides meet and the side beta alpha will describe the side alpha gamma and the point beta describes the diagonal beta gamma at the same time then beta will describe a line beta gamma which is much longer than alpha beta and the side alpha beta will pass along the side alpha gamma which is shorter than the diagonal though the velocity is the same in the same time and the side alpha beta has moved further than alpha though it is moved by only one movement for as the rhombus becomes more acute at beta and gamma alpha delta becomes the lesser diagonal and beta gamma greater and the side alpha beta less than beta gamma 
for it is strange as has been remarked that in some cases a point moved by two movements travels more slowly than a point moved by one and that while both the given points have equal velocity either one of them describes a greater line the reason is that when a point moves from an obtuse angle the sides are in almost opposite directions namely that in which the point itself is moved and that in which it is moved down by the side but when it moves from an acute angle it moves as it were in actual fact towards the same position for the angle of the sides contributes to increase the speed of the diagonal and in proportion as one makes the one angle more acute and the other more obtuse the movement is slower or quicker for the sides are brought into more opposite direction by the angle becoming more obtuse but they are brought into the same direction by the sides being brought nearer together for beta moves in practically the same direction in virtue of both its movements thus one contributes to assist the other and more so the more acute the angle becomes and the reverse is the case with alpha for it itself moves towards beta while the movement of the side alpha beta brings it down to delta and the more obtuse the angle is the more opposite will the movements be for the two sides become more like a straight line if they became actually a straight line the components would be absolutely in opposite directions but the side being moved in one direction only is interfered with by nothing in that case it naturally moves through a longer distance footnote id est in the direction of its length this is an extreme case in which the angle gamma alpha beta has gradually been made more and more obtuse until gamma alpha alpha beta have become merged in gamma beta the whole problem of this chapter may be well illustrated by two men the points alpha and beta walking in opposite directions along a barge the side alpha beta drifting at the same velocity if the barge is drifting in the direction of its own length alpha's final position will be that from which he started beta will have moved from beta one to beta two End footnote. chapter twenty four there is a question why a large circle traces out a path equal to that of a smaller circle when they are placed about the same centre but when they are rolled separately their paths are to one another in the proportion of their dimensions footnote four cases are considered one when the two circles are rolled along a horizontal plane independently two when they are fixed together and rolled along a plane eta kappa the tangent to the small circle three when they are fixed together and rolled along a plane zeta lambda the tangent to the larger circle four when they have the same center or axle but move independently cases two and three are referred to here End footnote. and further the center of both being one and the same at one time the path which they trace is of the same length as the smaller traces out alone and at another time of the length which the larger circle traces now it is manifest that the larger circle traces out the longer path 
for by mere observation it is plain that the angle which the circumference of each makes with its own diameter is greater in the case of the larger circle than in the smaller so that by observation the paths along which they roll will have this same proportion to one another but in fact it is manifest that when they are situated about the same centre this is not so but they trace out an equal path so that it comes to this that in the one case the path is equal to that traced by the larger circle in the other to that traced by the smaller let delta zeta gamma be the greater circle epsilon eta beta the lesser alpha the common center zeta iota the path along which the greater circle moves by its own motion and eta kappa the path of the smaller circle by its own motion equal to zeta lambda when then i move the smaller circle i move the same center alpha and now let the large circle be fixed to it whenever therefore alpha beta becomes perpendicular to eta kappa at kappa alpha gamma at the same time becomes perpendicular to zeta lambda at lambda so that they will always have traversed an equal distance eta kappa representing the arc eta beta and zeta lambda representing the arc zeta gamma and if one quadrant traces an equal path it is plain that the whole circle will trace out a path equal to that of the other whole circle so that whenever the line eta beta comes to kappa the arc zeta gamma will move along zeta lambda and the same is the case with the whole circle after one revolution in like manner if i roll the large circle fastening the smaller circle to it about the same centre alpha beta will be perpendicular and vertical at the same time as alpha gamma the latter to zeta iota at iota the former to eta theta at theta so that whenever the one eta beta shall have traversed a distance equal to eta theta and the other zeta gamma a distance equal to zeta iota and zeta alpha again becomes perpendicular to zeta lambda and alpha eta to eta kappa they will be in their original position at the points theta and iota and since there is no halting of the greater for the lesser so as to be at rest during an interval at the same point for in both cases both are moved continuously nor does the lesser skip any point it is strange that in one case the greater should traverse a distance equal to that traversed by the lesser and in the other case the lesser a distance equal to that traversed by the greater and further it is wonderful that though there is always only one movement the centre that is moved should be rolled forward in one case a great and in another a less distance for the same thing moved at the same velocity naturally traverses an equal distance and to move a thing at the same velocity is to move it an equal distance in both cases as to the reason this may be taken as a principle that the same or an equal force moves one mass more slowly and the other more quickly suppose that there is a body which is not naturally in motion of itself if another body which is naturally in motion move it and itself as well 
it will be moved more slowly than if it were being moved by its own motion alone. And if it be naturally in motion, and nothing is moved with it, the same is the case. So it is quite impossible for any body to be moved more than that which moves it, for it is not moved according to any rate of motion of its own, but at the rate of that which moves it. Let there be two circles, a greater alpha and a lesser beta. If the lesser were to push along the greater, when the greater is not rolling along, it is plain that the greater will traverse so much distance as it has been pushed by the lesser, and it has been pushed the same distance as the small circle has moved, so that they have both traversed an equal straight line. Necessarily, therefore, if the lesser be rolling while it pushes the greater, the latter will be rolled, as well as pushed, just so far as the lesser has been rolled, if the greater have no motion of its own. For, in the same way, and so far as the moving body moves it, so far must the body which is moved be moved thereby. So, indeed, the lesser circle has moved the greater so far and in such a way. We delicate in a circle, say one foot, for let that be the extent of the movement, and consequently the larger circle has moved that distance. So, too, if the large circle move the lesser, the lesser circle will have been moved just as far as the large circle, in whatever way the latter be moved, whether quickly or slowly, by its own motion, and the lesser circle will trace out a line at the same velocity and of the same length as the greater traced out by its natural movement. And this is just what causes the difficulty, that they do not act any longer when they are joined together in the same way as they acted when they were not connected, that is to say, when one is moved by the other not according to its natural motion, nor according to its own motion. For it makes no difference whether one is fixed round the other, or fitted inside it, or placed in contact with it. For in all these cases, when one moves, and the other is moved by it, the one will be moved just so far as the other moves it. Now, when one moves a circle by means of another circle in contact with it, or suspended from it, one does not revolve it continuously. But if one places them about the same center, the one must be continuously revolved by the other. But, nevertheless, the former is not moved in accordance with its own motion. But, just as if it had no proper motion, and if it has a proper motion, but does not make use of it, it comes to the same thing. Whenever, therefore, the large circle moves the small circle affixed to it, the small circle moves the same distance as the large, and vice versa. But when they are separate, each has its own motion. If any one raises the difficulty that, when the center is the same and is moving the two circles with equal velocity, they trace out unequal paths, he is reasoning falsely and sophistically. For the center is indeed the same for both, but only accidentally, just as the same thing may chance to be musical and white. For to be the center of each of the circles is not the same for it in the two cases. In conclusion, when it is the smaller circle that moves the greater, the center and source of motion is to be regarded as belonging to the smaller circle. But when the greater circle moves the lesser, it is to be regarded as belonging to the greater circle. Thus, the source of motion is not the same absolutely, though it is, in a sense, the same. Chapter 25 
why do they construct beds so that one dimension is double the other one side being six feet long or a little more the other three feet and why do they not stretch bed ropes diagonally do they make them of this size so as to fit the body thus they have one side twice the length of the other being four cubits long and two cubits wide the ropes are not stretched diagonally but from side to side so that the wooden frame may be less likely to break for wood can be cleft most easily if split thus in the natural way and when there is a pull upon it it is subject to a considerable strain further since the ropes have to be able to bear a weight there will be less of a strain when the weight is put upon them if they are strung crosswise rather than diagonally again less rope is used up by this method let alpha zeta eta iota be a bed and let zeta eta be divided into two equal parts at beta there is an equal number of holes in zeta beta and zeta alpha for the sides are equal each to each for the whole side zeta eta is double the side zeta alpha they stretch the rope on the method already mentioned from alpha to beta then to gamma delta theta and epsilon and so on until they turn back and reach another angle for the two ends of the rope come at two different angles footnote on this passage appelt comments figurum in re incerta non adidimus the above figure is taken from capelle who however says that it is impossible to work out the whole process of stringing the bed the author indicates the general method to be adopted when he says that the rope must be passed from alpha to beta gamma delta theta and that one rope is to be used and that its two ends come at different corners of the bed the process can be completed by passing the rope from theta to epsilon pi eta kappa omicron pi rho sigma iota beta gamma rho sigma nu lambda upsilon mu delta theta upsilon lambda omicron kappa zeta End footnote. now the parts of the rope which form the bends are equal exempli gratia alpha beta beta gamma are equal to gamma delta delta theta and so with other similar pairs of sides for the same demonstration holds good in all cases for alpha beta is equal to epsilon theta for the opposite sides of the parallelogram beta eta kappa alpha are equal and the holes are an equal distance apart from one another and beta eta is equal to kappa alpha for the angle at beta is equal to the angle at eta for the exterior angle of a parallelogram is equal to the interior opposite angle and the angle at beta is half a right angle for zeta beta is equal to zeta alpha and the angle at zeta is a right angle and the angle at beta is equal to the angle at eta for the angle at zeta is a right angle since the bed is a rectangular figure one side of which is double the other and divided into two equal parts so that beta gamma is equal to epsilon eta 
as also is kappa theta, for it is parallel. So that beta gamma is equal to kappa theta, and gamma epsilon to delta theta. In like manner, it can be demonstrated that all the other pairs of sides which form the bends of the rope are equal to one another, so that clearly there are four such lengths of rope as alpha beta in the bed, and there is half the number of holes in the half zeta beta that there is in the whole zeta eta. Footnote. These lines seem more hopelessly corrupt and unintelligible than those preceding them. End footnote. So that in the half of the band there are lengths of rope, such as alpha beta, and they are of the same number as there are holes in beta eta, or what comes to the same thing, in alpha zeta, zeta beta together. But if the rope be strung diagonally, as in the bed, alpha beta gamma delta, footnote, a figure apparently in which the rope is strung along the diagonals alpha gamma and beta delta, and parallel to them on either side, end footnote, the halves are not of the same length as the sides of both, alpha zeta and zeta eta, but they are of the same number as the holes in zeta beta, zeta alpha. But alpha zeta, zeta beta, being two, are greater than alpha beta, so that the rope is longer by the amount by which the two sides taken together are greater than the diagonal. Chapter 26. Why is it more difficult to carry a long plank of wood on the shoulder if one holds it at the end than if it is held in the middle, though the weight is the same? Is it because, as the plank vibrates, the end prevents one from carrying it because it tends to interrupt one's progress by its vibration? No, for if it does not bend at all, and is not very long, it is nevertheless more difficult to carry if it be held at the end. It is easier to carry if one holds it in the middle rather than at the end, for the same reason for which it is easier to lift in that way. The reason is that if one lifts it in the middle, the two ends always lighten one another, and one side lifts the other side up. For the middle, where the lifter or carrier holds it, forms as it were the center, and each of the two ends, inclining downwards, raises up and lightens the other end, whereas if it is lifted or carried from one end, this effect is not produced, but all the weight inclines in one direction. Let alpha be the middle of a plank which is raised or carried, and let beta and gamma be the extremities. When the plank is lifted or carried at the point alpha, beta inclines downwards and raises gamma up, and gamma inclines downwards and raises beta up. The effect is produced by their being raised up at the same moment. Chapter 27 Why is a very long object more difficult to carry on the shoulder, even if one carries it in the middle, than a shorter object of the same weight? In the last case we said that the vibration was not the reason. In this case it is the reason, for the longer an object is, the more its extremities vibrate, and so it would be more difficult for the man to carry it. The reason of the increased vibration is that, though the movement is the same, 
the extremities change their position more the longer the piece of wood is let the shoulder which is the centre for it is at rest be at alpha and let alpha beta and alpha gamma be the radii then the longer the radius alpha beta or alpha gamma is the greater is the amplitude of movement this point has already been demonstrated chapter twenty eight why do they construct swipes by the side of wells by attaching the lead as a weight at the end of the bar the bucket being itself a weight whether it is empty or full is the reason that the drawing of water being divided into two operations distinct in time for the bucket has to be dipped and then drawn up it is an easy task to let it down when it is empty but difficult to raise it when it is full it is therefore of advantage to lower it rather more slowly with a view to lightening the weight considerably when it is drawn up again this effect is produced by the lead or stone attached to the end of the swipe in letting it down there is a heavier weight to lift than if one has merely to lower the empty bucket but when it is full the lead or whatever the weight attached is helps to draw it up and so the two operations taken together are easier than on the other method chapter twenty nine why is it that when two men are carrying an equal weight on a piece of wood or something of the kind the pressure on them is not equal unless the weight is in the middle but it presses more on the person carrying it to whom it is nearest is it because the wood when they hold it in this way becomes a lever and the load forms the fulcrum and the carrier nearer to the load becomes the weight which is to be moved while the other carrier becomes the mover of the weight the further the latter is from the weight the more easily he moves it and the more he presses down the other man since the load placed on the wood and acting as a fulcrum as it were offers resistance but if the load is placed in the middle one carrier does not act as a weight on the other any more than the other on him or exercise any motive force upon him but each is equally a weight upon the other chapter thirty why is it that when people rise from a sitting position they always do so by making an acute angle between the thigh and the lower leg and between the chest and the thigh otherwise they cannot rise is it because equality is always a cause of rest and a right angle causes an equality it is when a line is perpendicular the angles on either side of it are equal and so causes equilibrium so in rising a man moves towards a position at equal angles to the earth's circumference for it is not the case that he will actually be at right angles to the ground or is it because when a man rises he tends to become upright and a man who is standing must be perpendicular to the ground if then he is to be at right angles to the ground that means that he must have his head in the same line as his feet and this occurs when he is rising as long then as he is sitting he keeps his feet and head parallel to one another and not in the same straight line let alpha be the head alpha beta the line of the chest beta gamma the thigh and gamma delta the lower leg then alpha beta the line of the chest 
is at right angles to the thigh, and the thigh at right angles to the lower leg, when a man is seated in this way. In this position, then, a man cannot rise, but to do so he must bend the leg and place the feet at a point under the head. This will be the case if gamma delta be moved to gamma zeta, and the result will be that he can rise immediately, and he will have his head and his feet in the same straight line, and gamma zeta will form an acute angle with beta gamma. Chapter 31 Why is it that a body which is already in motion is easier to move than one which is at rest? For example, a wagon which is in motion can be propelled more quickly than one which has to be started. Is it because, in the first place, it is very difficult to move in one direction a weight which is already moving in the opposite direction? For, though the motive force may be much quicker, yet some of it is lost, for the propulsion exerted by that which is being pushed in the opposite direction must necessarily become slower. And so, secondly, the propulsion must be slower if the body is at rest, for even that which is at rest offers resistance. When a body is moving in the same direction as that which pushes it, the effect is just as if one increased the force and speed of the motive power, for by moving forward it produces of itself exactly the effect which that power would have upon it. Chapter 32. Why is it that an object which is thrown eventually comes to a standstill? Does it stop when the force which started it fails, or because the object is drawn in a contrary direction, or is it due to its downward tendency which is stronger than the force which threw it? Or is it absurd to discuss such questions while the principle escapes us? Chapter 33. How is it that a body is carried along by a motion not its own, if that which started it does not keep following and pushing it along? Is it not clear that in the beginning the impelling force so acted as to push one thing along, and this in its turn pushes along something else. The moving body comes to a standstill when the force which pushes it along can no longer so act as to push it, and when the weight of the moving object has a stronger inclination downwards than the forward force of that which pushes it. Chapter 34 why is it that neither small nor large bodies travel far when thrown, but they must have due relation to the person who throws them? Is it because that which is thrown or pushed must offer resistance to that from which it is pushed, and whatever does not yield owing to its mass, or does not resist owing to its weakness, does not admit of being thrown or pushed. A body, then, which is far beyond the force which tries to push it, does not yield at all, while that which is far weaker offers no resistance. Or is it because that which travels along does so only as far as it moves the air to its depth, and that which is not moved cannot itself move anything either. Both these things are the case here. That which is very large, and that which is very small, must be looked upon as not moving at all. For the latter does not move anything, while the former is not itself at all moved. Chapter 35 why is it that an object which is carried round in whirling water is always eventually carried into the middle? 
is it because the object has magnitude, so that it has position in two circles, one of its extremities revolving in a greater, and the other in a lesser circle? The greater circle, then, on account of its greater velocity, draws it round, and thrusts it sideways into the lesser circle. But, since the object has breadth, the lesser circle in its turn does the same thing and thrusts it into the next interior circle, until it reaches the center. Here the object remains because it stands in the same relation to all the circles, being in the middle, for the middle is equidistant from the circumference in the case of each of the circles. Or, is it because an object which, owing to its magnitude, the motion of the whirling water cannot overcome, but which, by its weight, prevails over the velocity of the revolving circle, must necessarily be left behind and travel along more slowly? Now, the lesser circle travels more slowly, for the greater and the lesser circle do not revolve over the same space in an equal time when they move round the same centre. And so the object must be left revolving in a lesser and lesser circle until it reaches the middle. If the force of the whirling water prevails at first, it will go on doing so to the end, for one circle must prevail, and then the next over the weight of the object owing to their velocity so that the whole object is continually being left behind in the next circle towards the center. For an object over which the water does not prevail must be carried either inwards or outwards. Such an object cannot then be carried along in its original position. Still less can it be carried along in the outer circle, for the velocity of the outer circle is greater. The only alternative is that the object over which the water does not prevail is transferred to the inner circle. Now every object has a tendency to resist force, but since the arrival at the middle puts an end to motion and the center alone is at rest, all objects must necessarily collect there. End of chapter 35 and end of Mechanica by Aristotle